It's Tuesday, November 2nd. You are watching the Macro Setup. I'm Dan Nathan. Guy Adami sadly is on vacation, but he will be back next week. We do have some great guests for you today. First up, Chris Verone. He is a partner at Strategus, and he was just ranked the number two technical analyst on Wall Street in the annual Institutional Investor All-American Research Survey. That is amazing. And his firm, I think, was rated the number one macro shop on the street. So congrats to Strategus and Chris. And later, we're going to be joined by Chris Vecchio. He's a senior strategist at Daily FX. So he's going to join us here to cover all things macro. But first, the macro setup is brought to you by our presenting sponsors, Nadex, the leading U.S. exchange for binary options, call spreads, and Guy Adami, I wish you were here, and knockouts. Uh, I always help them out with that one here. And of course, Open Exchange. They manage virtual meetings that matter for the top companies around the world. Chris Verone, the newly minted number two technical analyst on uh, the II Institutional Survey. Thanks for joining us, bud. Yeah, it's great to be here, Dan. Thanks for having me. Man, let's get into it. This is going to be a busy, busy week. It's been a busy couple months here. We've had some volatility, you know, that September sell-off and that October ricochet was pretty dramatic here. And I know that there's a lot of strategists who are kind of repositioning for year end and trying to get a sense of what all the inputs might be for a continuation of the stock market rally into the new year. Last night on CNBC's Fast Money, we were talking to a strategist who was saying that he thinks this rally peters out a little bit sometime um, in and around Thanksgiving or so. But I was reminded by a friend of mine, and I think he's a friend of yours, uh, Tony Dwyer over there at Canaccord, and he pinged me while I was on the show as we were discussing this. It's like history, actually, when you have a market up about 22% through October, it usually follows through the end of the year. Some of the data that he had suggests that you could see a November, December surge of about 6%. How does that line up with some of the things that you're using as inputs to your market call right now, Chris? Well, yeah, I think that's exactly right. But Dan, I would you know, say, let's not forget, in September, when S&P, I think at its worst, was down maybe 6% from the highs, to us, you know, that was the culmination of what was really a six or seven month correction for the average stock, right? So even while the index was going up in spring and summer, look at the average industrial, look at the average yeah. discretionary, the average energy name was down meaningfully. We calculated the average Russell 1000 stock was actually down close to 20% uh, over that stretch from point to point. So, you know, you got kind of that index weakness in September, but I think we both know that the index is really not a reflection of what the average stock is doing anymore. The index is five stocks, right? And we know what those five stocks are. What I've been really encouraged by, let's call it last six, seven, eight weeks, is that as the S&P has made new highs here, and we see the chart, you know, S&P through 4,600, it's done so with some better breath. We've seen new highs re-expand. We've seen leadership get more cyclical. So I looked at this, frankly, as a healthier setup today than what we saw most of the spring and through the summer. Yeah, and, and on a week that we're going to have a Fed meeting that's likely to kind of signal the fact they're going to start tapering bond purchases, the fact that the stock market can hang out here at highs after such a sharp move um, over such a short period of time, I think is no doubt about it bullish. And to your point, I think the breadth of the widening breadth is something that's really helping the case. And we're going to talk about some of those mega cap names uh, in particular. What do you look at, Chris? So when I'm looking at that 50-day moving average, that was a gap level on a couple, a couple really big down days um, back in September. Is that a level, that 44.65 that you're keeping an eye on to the downside? If we were to kind of come in back towards that breakout level, um, you know, again, that 200-day moving average, we haven't sniffed it in a yeah. year, and it doesn't look like we're <laughs> going to do it anytime soon. Well, that's the thing. You know, the S&P has not sniffed the 200, NASDAQ has, and most stocks have, right? So, you know, when you kind of look at the index here, now let's keep in mind, S&P broke out through about 4550. That was the old high. So I think that should be your first reference point if you're kind of caring about levels underneath that, call it 4475. That 50 day is gaining, you know, three, four points a day. So that ascending moving average, I think speaks to the trend. But, you know, the bigger picture for me, Dan, is like, there is nothing about this market right now that suggest economic growth is slowing. And I think from a macro discussion, you know, almost all the leadership stuff we look at is suggestive that 
economic growth might be re-accelerating here. I mean, look at the relationship between discretionary versus staples. That's something we look at every day. That just made new highs. And that's just not Tesla. Or, but equally weighted, discretionary outperforming staples. Look at the strength in the transports or the resurgence in the energy or the financials or the banks, right? So when we look at the leadership fabric of, uh, of this market, I think it's suggestive that the growth scare or the supply chain issues, the market's in the mood to look through it all. Yeah, it certainly is. And I think you make the point about the equal weight S&P 500, which to me yeah. was very interesting, made a new all time high prior to the NASDAQ, you know, in the last couple of weeks or so. So it speaks to that. If we look at this NDX chart, the NASDAQ 100, you know, we have six stocks now that make up about 50 percent of the weight. And to your point that, you know, if they all go in the same direction, right, that could be a problem. But last week, based on fundamental news, we saw two go one way two go the other and, you know, a bunch of haywire action let's call it between Facebook yeah. and Tesla. And here we are making new all time highs. I suspect that that chart looks very similar to you than the S&P 500. You have, you know, 50 day moving average down there. It's about 15,300 or so. And the idea of getting back towards 14,225, the 200 day moving average is not likely. We need to see a massive situation with some individual names moving on fundamental news. Yeah. And then just the sort of sell off we have not seen from a high um, all year. Well, I think what's you know compelling here, Dennis, you're making new highs in NASDAQ one without Amazon, yeah. without Facebook. Apple's been stuck, right? Yeah. It's really Microsoft and Google that have kind of led the charge here. You're doing it without PayPal, without MasterCard, right? All these names that were important. So there must be strength coming from other places. And you know, one of the areas we've seen really reassert themselves, um, which is represented in, in this index are the semis. I mean, we look at the ratio of semis to software to kind of get an understanding of within the NASDAQ, are we favoring the more pro-cyclical semis or the more defensive software names? And um, semis just made multi-year highs relative to software. So that is what you're seeing kind of under the surface of NASDAQ one. Now, you know, one thing I would just point out, and we highlighted this to clients earlier in the week, flows into the triple Qs are very, very aggressive here. You're like in the 95th, 96th percentile of all historical observations. And you know that just tells us you do have to maybe be a little bit more on guard when flows are that full, everything kind of has to go right because everyone's positioned in the same way. So just yeah. be a little bit mindful of that over the next couple months. You don't get great absolute signals from that, but you do get decent relative signals from that. And you know that might make the case, hey, maybe we want to be bigger small caps over NASDAQ 1 here. And I think that's a very logical place to kind of go next. Yeah, I actually think there's a lot of landmines out there in, in large cap yeah. land. And we're just seeing one this morning. You know, look at Chegg down 45% in one fell swoop. I mean, literally to lose almost half your value because you're missing, um, you know, an earnings um, and, and, and an outlook is really dangerous. And it reminds me of other periods past. It, it's kind of toppy behavior. And don't think for a second, it's not, I mean, you may not know what Chegg is, the online ed education company, but I remember about a week and a half ago when Snapchat was down 25% in one fell swoop. So those sorts of reactions to fundamental news are something to kind of keep an eye on because sooner or later, as they start racking up, it could have the potential to kind of outweigh some of the performance by some of the mega cap leaders. Well, Dan, I would add to that, you know, what is Chegg and Snap and some others have in common is that they went into earnings in very wounded positions. I mean, it's not like Ch Chegg was a very good stock the last six months. I mean, this was a stock that was trading below the moving averages, downward sloping 200. That is not the setup you want into, you know, high profile numbers. Yeah, no, I agree. And you just mentioned, you know, kind of the, the broadening out and we got to talk about small caps. At one point this year, the yeah. Russell 2000 had a market cap that was less than Apple's when it was about two, two and a half trillion or something like that. Um, now that's obviously kind of moving back towards the prior high. It's been in this huge long base. You saw the lines that I drew here. Is that prior yeah. resistance going to be support? You talk about moving averages. We have the 200 and the 50 day. They're kind of converging here. They're moving up. It's made a series of um, higher lows here, it looks constructive. Yeah, I'd make two points here. Um, I think it was January or February in that, you know, widely watched Bank of America Merrill Lynch Fund survey. I think the institutional community highlighted small caps as their favorite idea for 2021. And, you know, what happened promptly? Small caps did nothing for 10 months. Um, we needed to work off the excessive sentiment from earlier this year. And I think 10 months of a range 
uh, did just that. And now we kind of have this move here, you know, Russell 2 breaking out highest level since March. We're seeing the number of individual stocks in the Russell 2 that are making new highs start to expand as well. And it's happening at the time of the year, calendar wise, where you're really entering the sweet spot for small versus large outperformance. But let's call it November to March is kind of the sweetest part of the calendar here. So I do think there's a lot of things going for small here. Um, I like pairing them and I frankly like pairing them against NASDAQ one. If you look at the flow dynamic, huge flows into NASDAQ suggested to crowd it. They've actually had big outflows from Russell too for the last six months. So there's a nice dynamic there between IWM and triple Q's that, you know, that's a pair that we want to play here. And you know, again, I, I would just add, I mean, the, the sector composition here is more reflective of actually what's working right now too, right? A lot of regional banks, energy, uh, et cetera. Yeah, no, I like that. That makes sense to me, actually, if you're if you're thinking about it on a relative basis. And I think from a valuation standpoint, it makes um, some sense, too. Let's talk about volatility. We've had bouts of it. But, you know, if we think about peak to trough, you just mentioned, you know, 6% from the highs in the S&P 500, barely from the highs in September. Look at the VIX here. You see it's just been ground down. You see that level in which it kind of launched off of prior to the pandemic or right as that was kind of unfolding. Um, you know, that was obviously a black swan sort of a event. Um, you know, it's just telling me that investors are once again fairly complacent. The the moves higher, the new daily highs in the S&P 500, they're just kind of gradual, if you will. Um, you know, so just keep an eye on that. We don't really chart the VIX. I'm sure you don't spend a lot of time uh, doing that either. But it's just worth noting that if you were to see... Uh, I don't know, some sort of runaway, you know, uh, breakout here, you're going to see the VIX back below um, 15 bucks or so, which could mean, you know, I don't know. What does it mean to you? It it doesn't mean much to me other than the fact that we've reached like crazy town. Yeah, Dan, you know, I I think ultimately volatility is really just a derivative of credit. So as long as credit conditions are pretty benign, vol is going to be pretty benign. and, And that's kind of been the case. I think if you're looking to make a contrarian call here Um, I would want to wait for the price action to kind of confirm that. You start getting VIX above, let's call it 18 and a half, 19, and keeping it above 18 and a half, 19, that might suggest some new vol regime. But, you know, this is a derivative of credit. And I think so long as high yield spreads are relatively tight, you're not going to see a big move here. So that's kind of our tell. I think so far, so good. But as always, you know, things change in this business and we have to be intellectually honest with ourselves. And if that changes, we'll change. Yeah, I'm with you there. I think we're going to get a change in some sentiment as it relates to the Fed. Um, We have a meeting tomorrow. I think it's fairly well telegraphed. I think it's really kind of hard to argue, especially given the way that the Fed speak has been with markets at all all time highs with, like you said, you know, the the expectations for growth. While we did see a meaningful deceleration over the course of the summer, it's kind of been explained away by some of these supply chain issues and Delta and that sort of thing. So the idea that the Fed um, is not going to follow through on you know the thought that they're going to start tapering bond buying listen could they be a bit more aggressive than people think maybe i don't know i i'm not sure what you think here but one of the one of the things that i think is most interesting chris right now is that with inflation expectations as high as they are which is kind of giving the fed some more oomph to kind of move forward with that plan you know why is the 10-year u.s treasury yield not at its 52-week highs you know back in march we saw it at 1.7 and seven. And back then, there was a lot more optimism about growth. And there was a lot more optimism that the Fed might start moving quicker than they have. Dan, I think that's right. And, you know, if you think about what the release valve for higher inflation has been this year, it's not been the rate market, it's been the commodity market. Um, you know, maybe now you're starting to see the short end kind of around the world reflect to change. You saw it with Aussie, you see it in the UK. But as you speak, I mean, 10-year yields have largely been in a range since March, uh, you know, 175 on the high side, 120 on the low side. We're stuck in this range. I do think ultimately they do break out. I know that's a consensus call. But, you know, when you look at what is consensus, though, the bond bears really aren't that bearish, right? Like even the bond bear, like, okay, maybe they can go to 180 or two. That's really not bearish. I, I don't know anyone out there with a 275 call or something. And I, I don't know if that's the right call, but it just strikes me that really the bond bears aren't that bearish anymore. Now, with respect to kind of the shape of the curve, though, you know, twos and tens, I do think is something we do want to keep an eye on, right? We have this view that the growth scare is over. The market is telling us economic growth is going to be more abundant. 
I would have to question that view with two tens under, let's call it 90 basis points. I think 90 bips is kind of my line in the sand for the bond market really confirming this view. And remember, the good news is the flattener thus far has been a bear flattener, right? So the curve is flattened because two-year yields have gone up. Yep. I would prefer that over a bull flattener. Like, I don't want to see a curve flatten because short rates are falling. So that is a good dynamic. But I think to your point, Dan, we're entering this kind of taper week or this taper announcement. It might be the most telegraphed Fed action I can remember in my career. So I I have to imagine this is a discounting mechanism that we're talking about. Yep. A lot of this uh, has likely been priced in at this point. So it's funny, you're a little younger than me, uh, Chris Verone, but I remember that the taper tantrums, hey, listen, they were pretty well telegraphed when we were coming out of, you know, QE in the last, after the last yeah. cycle too. So, and we did have some stock market volatility. So what I'm saying here, you know, and I look at that flattening yield curve and I see the reasons why, but I also see the fact that the long end is not moving in the 10 year, at least the way that I might've expected it to. So I'm actually yeah. expecting some volatility, even though this is well telegraphed here. But let's move to gold, uh, because when we're talking about inflation, I mean, listen, I, you know, this thing is just it, it, it did what it was supposed to do in the summer of 2020. Right. When we were still in the, the what some we're calling a black hole um, as it relates to the lockdowns and the economic, you know, shutdowns and obviously all the health issues with, um, you know, the uncertainty about the pandemic. But this is not a particularly great chart. Now, we see the good support just below 1700 there, but it's making a series of of lower highs here. It's stuck right at its 200-day moving average. What are you telling clients about gold here? And obviously, we can't talk about gold, you know, without talking about the other thing. You know what I'm talking about too. But let's do the other thing. I know what you're talking about. So, you know, Dan, think about the paradox of gold here, right? It was at its strongest, you know, in the early days of COVID, when everyone perceived COVID to be deflationary, right? And then as the narrative changed to the policy Pulse post COVID would be inflationary. Gold hasn't worked, right? So this this widely held view that gold is some inflationary head really hasn't held up in this environment at all. Um, I have found it interesting. Let's call it the last six, eight, ten weeks. It feels like the bears or the shorts should have been able to kill gold here. It yeah. feels like they should have been able to break it down, and they just can't seem to break it. Now, I don't think this is a do anything chart yet. You start breaking this out above 1840, 1850, 1860, okay, I think we got to put some on. But until then, I'm kind of, and I hate this call, uh, sitting and watching, but I think this is a moment to sit and watch here until we get a little resolution because we've been in this yeah. you know, range for three months now, four months now, uh, but they can't kill it. And I'm always interested when things don't go down when they should. And there's been a lot of reasons gold should go down the last couple of months and it hasn't. Yeah, I think a lot of that has to do, and I know that there's a lot of smart friends of mine in the business who disagree with me here. It just seems that the incremental buyer of gold is buying Bitcoin or, or, or related sort of, you know, um, kind of risk assets because they know that the bang for their buck, if gold is going to go up from 1800 back to 2000, right? So just do the math there. It's a 10% move to get it back to those highs. Bitcoin is certainly going to go up a lot more, right? And so that's one of the things that I just think is kind of worth thinking about here. And I just want you to kind of get get your sense. I mean, listen, but the volatility, listen, you also have 50 percent drawdowns from highs. You know what I mean? And then 100 no. percent rallies. And so a lot of investors um, thinking about in he, uh, inflation hedges, they don't see something that can go down 50 percent, maybe in a matter of months as a great hedge. Right. And so um, it really depends what you're thinking about here. Um, I just think that that, you know, yes, there's lots of people who've been tracking, you know, gold's relative um, performance to inflation expectations for hundreds of thousands of years. It just thinks it just seems like the jig is up at this point. You know, Dan, I, I think, you know, the discussion we just had about taper is actually relevant here with Bitcoin. If you believe, like I believe, that Bitcoin is um, maybe the most important liquidity indicator out there, right? Yeah. I mean, this is something that was born out of uh, abundance of liquidity over the last you know, 10, 12, 13 years um, in this very activist central bank cycle. If Fed taper is really going to contract global liquidity, I would expect things like Bitcoin to not work, yet that hasn't happened, right? So yeah. I think the market is suggested, or it did happen in the spring, right? When maybe the idea of taper was more novel, but it's not happening today. So back to the discussion of what's priced in, I think the strength from Bitcoin is suggestive, or Ethereum or any of them is suggestive that, hey, maybe a, a Fed taper, let's not forget, is actually still an easing. We're going to add another $500 billion on the balance sheet, even as they tapered. 
Now, I'll give you another data point kind of uh, in this context. Look at the financial stocks that have their mouth on the spigot of all this liquidity. All these publicly traded private equity companies, Blackstone, Apollo, right? Oh, these are still all making new highs, right? So, you know, presumably they would be impacted by a contraction in liquidity, and you're not seeing that there either. So, you know, this all is part of this broader macro discussion. We are in a liquidity cycle. Therefore, what are the liquidity barometers doing? I think they're okay here. Bitcoin yeah. is an example of that. The private equity names are an example of that as well. No, those are great points. And I would just say that, you know, you know, narratives and markets, um, they're ignoring some of the potential. I mean, listen, what's clear is this, that expectations for Fed hikes have been moved up. And, and the, the, I guess yeah. in the, the, the fortitude to start tapering might increase from whatever they're, they're targeting, 15 um, billion to possibly 20 or more. Um, at that point, we will have stock market volatility because valuations will become a thing with rates going higher and the speed in which that um, liquidity is being pulled. You know, just real quick, Quickly on Ethereum, you just mentioned it. You know, this is one that if you watch the macro setup, you know, I spend more time on this. I'm just more interested in the stuff that's being built around it rather than the macro factors as it relates to Bitcoin. I'm just a dumb stock and options jockey here. So this thing kind of speaks to me. This is uh, really what, uh, you know, to me, the Web3 looks like or is built on in some of the protocols and, and the applications. That's what's interests me here. All right, let's quickly do this. We just spent a lot of time on the macro here, but it's really interesting when you think about what's just happened to Tesla, there has been no news that's been able to knock it down. Even when the stock market sold off 5 6% in September, Tesla was up on the month here. It's gone up about 50% in what? A little more than a month, $1.2 trillion market cap. It's knocked out Facebook. It's just come down um, below $1 trillion here. What do you make of this Tesla? I mean, this is truly astounding here. And to me, it does speak of sentiment in the market here because there's nothing... It's just divorced from any fundamentals or are we just thinking about it incorrectly? But I look at that chart and I say to myself, I cannot think of a scenario how that can be below nine hundred dollars anytime soon ever again. I don't know. Yeah, Dan, I'm, I'm kind of with you. When this thing broke through nine hundred, it was kind of uh, all systems go. And, you know, we made this point yesterday on Closing Bell. Actually, we said, OK, for a stock that's up 40 percent over the last really two weeks, right? It's up 40 over the last two weeks. It still has the most number of sell ratings on it from sell side analysts than any stock in the Russell 1000. It has 14 sales from the sell side. And it is the, right? so I still think you need to see a capitulation of the analysts ultimately. Yeah. Now, is it tactically overbought here? Absolutely. Could it come back to, you know, 10, 10, 50? Certainly. Um, but you still need to see a capitulation of the bears, which I, I do not think we uh, have seen here. Now, what I think is a little bit misleading, the move in the autos is not just Tesla. Like the global autos are working. Yeah. I mean, yeah. we know Ford, I think GM is getting better. Look at Stellantis, look at BMW, look at Daimler, look, look at Toyota. I mean, this is a group move. This is the general, but this is a group move uh, across the board. Yeah, and I think that's probably a healthy thing. I mean, ultimately, you know, Tesla's going to have to come back in and settle in at a range, and you might see the valuations. And this is the bull case for GM and Ford and some of the Germans and uh, and the Japanese autos, is that ultimately they're going to be revalued on uh, at least a portion of their business on their EV ambitions. Let's quickly um, hit Metaverse before you get out of here. We really appreciate your time so far. Metaverse, that's what I called it here, but it's Facebook for just a little longer here. Not a great chart, at least that break of the no. uptrend that's been in place from the March 2020 lows. You see that support just around 300. That was the breakout level um, from the spring. The 200-day moving average is right around here. Um, it seems like the news flow, even when they want to change the narrative like they tried to last week, it doesn't really help the, the sentiment here. You know, this is a stock that for a number of years was impervious to, to bad news or was impervious to regulatory risk or yeah. you know, Justice Department. Uh, all and it's not anymore. And that is a change in character. Um, it got oversold over the last week or two. It can probably bounce 350, 360. I think it's the best you're going to do. I'd be more inclined to fade that move than I would to chase it. Yeah. Um, and it speaks to the idea that, you know, Fang, I, I guess we shouldn't call it Fang anymore, right? we got to rename the acronym. Um, I think Gamma works, right? Google, yeah. Alphabet, Microsoft, Meta, and uh, Apple, um, which is probably fitting given the Gamma mood that the market's been in. Um, I think, you know, this is reflective of that group of stocks no longer being treated as an asset class anymore. And they've been treated as an asset class basically for a decade. 
And that's not the case anymore. I mean, look at Amazon. Amazon hasn't made anyone any money in 18 months, 19 months. Um, curiously, you know, there's there's 60 analysts who cover Amazon. All 60 of them have a buy on the stock, yeah. right? For a name that hasn't made anyone any money in 18 months, man, that's a long time to be wrong. So it's things like that that just have us like, wow, what's going on with this group? It's starting to bifurcate here a little bit. Yeah, no doubt about it. I think it's the way you think of it as an asset class makes sense. And I've just been thinking of it as the QQQ, if you think about it, because again, these five or six names make up half the weight yeah. of it. And I think that's the place to be right now, because you will, will even if you do see some of the bifurcation um, in some of the top names, there's other names that are kind of picking up some of the slack and there's other secular themes that um, are going to be um, really powerful over the next few years. Obviously, those who are um, in and around whatever the metaverse is, we're going to hope to define that a little bit in the coming weeks and months. Listen, Chris Verone, thank you for joining us here on the Macro Setup. Chris is a partner at Strategus and was just named the number two technical analyst on Wall Street in the annual investor, uh, institutional investor, All-American Research Survey. So congrats, um, Chris, on that. You can follow Chris at Verone underscore Chris on Twitter. He's on CNBC plenty. You'll see him on Fast Money with us and he does a lot of the other shows so you can get his fine work there and hopefully, Chris, you will come back. So thank you and, and congrats to your firm because that macro yeah. um, that t macro top spot is certainly an honor. Thanks, Chris. Dan, yeah, thanks for having me. Great to be here. Thanks, bud. All right, we're going to switch gears here a little bit to another Chris whose last name also ends with a V. Chris Vecchio, you know him. He's our very, very frequent uh, guest on the macro setup here. Chris is a strategist at Daily FX and a quite fine one here. Chris, welcome back to the macro setup, bud. Thanks, Dan. Good to follow another Chris V, ironically enough. <laughs> <laughs> you guys should start like a rock band or something. I don't know, maybe like a macro, um, a macro trading group or something like that. But listen, man, you just heard what we had to say. What are some of the themes that really stuck out to you as you think about this really big week? You know, you've been on the macro setup with us um, on numerous occasions talking about Fed hike um, expectations, your direction and the speed in which they might um, kind of come to us have been spot on for the last couple of months. What are some of the kind of thoughts that you have on my uh, uh, conversation with Chris Verone. Yeah, so one thing that I, I took away from that segment earlier was that we're seeing improving breath in some of these stock market indices. And I think it's noteworthy that uh, the Russell's beginning to perform well. Even the QQEW, the equal weighted NASDAQ, is starting to show its head, uh, poke its head above water relative to the broader index. And so those are good signs. In fact, they reflect what's been an improving economic momentum here over the past few weeks. We know that the third quarter GDP reading for the US was quite paltry, just around 2%. Uh, but according to the Atlanta Fed GDP Now Tracking Index, which for the third quarter was pegging growth at 0.2% annualized, it's actually up to 8.2% after the month of October's data. And when we sprinkle in the fact that we have initial jobless claims holding near cycle lows for the entire pandemic, it seems that that labor market rebound is back underway. So we do have a strengthening US economy here, and it points to what is Overall, a picture where I'm going to have to disagree with some things we've said in the past. I don't think we're heading towards stagflation. You know, stagflation being high inflation, low uh, employment, and low demand. Well, demand is through the roof. Consumption is on fire right now. Durable goods orders are at their highest levels ever, exceeding the pre-pandemic pace. And we know that the labor market is increasingly in, in better shape. So um, the way I see this, the Fed is going to be moving forward with their taper announcement by the time this video is released. It's going to be tomorrow or perhaps it's yesterday whenever you listen to it. Uh, but a taper announcement is coming. Looks like we're going to get a minimum of $15 billion per month at a run rate of about eight months. That tapers out the asset purchases through July 2022. There is an outside chance, however, and I don't want to dismiss this because we've seen inflation stick its head above water for longer and higher and faster than the Fed anticipated, perhaps it goes at 20 billion per month. If that's the case, the cycle ends in May, and that sets up what the market is now pricing, the first rate hike to come, over about a 60% chance for June 2022. So, Chris, interesting stuff here. Do you think that the Fed, um, you know, they don't start out of the gate at tomorrow's announcement with a number that is higher than people expect on the taper? Or is that still, um, do you think it's in the cards? I think it's certainly in the cards. It's a possibility. Although I'm somewhat reminded of the situation that we had in 2013 when the uh, taper conversation was underway. That year, the Fed actually delayed the start of its taper in part because of a government shutdown 
in the month of October. And so we do have this debt ceiling debate coming up once more again. We have to keep our eyes on Washington, D.C. for the month of December. Perhaps the Grinch will steal Christmas once more. But with that in the background, I think that reduces the odds of having an upside surprise for that potential $20 billion per month. I think we're going to stick to 15. I think the Fed has been very clear about transmitting its desire to begin tapering soon. The conversation from various Fed officials has been rather poignant over the last month, uh, but they have given the market plenty of time. I mean, we've joked about how they're talking about talking about tapering, and then they're talking about tapering, and finally we're at the tapering. So um, overall, though, this has been moving according to plan. It's as clear as day as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. So, you know, you heard us talk about rates um, a little bit. And I was surprised that the 10 year is not a bit higher. Another thing I'm surprised about, and you and I have been talking about this with Guy over the last few weeks, this move in the Dixie, the U.S. dollar index, it's gotten back to those prior highs from last fall. It was rejected there. Um, we're seeing a little bit of a flag being formed here. You know, I just go back. I'm a simple guy. You're a smart guy. Uh, you can run circles around me as it comes to FX here, obviously, on a daily basis. You see what I did there. Um, but when I look back to past periods or specifically, you know, when we started to taper after the financial crisis, we saw the dollar move pretty dramatically and we saw rates obviously go higher. What's your take on the U.S. dollar here? And are we setting the stage for an upside breakout? Well, technically speaking, it appears that we are indeed flagging. You may want to call this a, a bullish falling wedge, which would point to a return back to uh, the yearly highs and the area in which we found support in the month of October came right at those former yearly highs that we set it back in March and again in August. So technically, you know, resistance has become support, so to speak. Um, but my concern this week is that the market is priced for perfection, right? When we talk about Fed rate hike odds right now, when we talk about the shape of the U.S. yield curve, these have both moved consistent with the manner in which uh, what happened in 2013, 2014. And we have basically five plus hikes priced into the end of 2023. The Fed has taken painstaking steps to tell us that tapering is not tightening. Rate hikes are not connected to the taper. You know, wink. I think that the rate hikes are coming after the taper, uh, as has been the case historically. And so I do think that this particular week here, we're going to get a lot of news. I don't know if we're going to get that directional break, though. I mean, the Fed's going to really have to surprise us with something more hawkish. I don't know if that's in the cards right now. So the dollar could whipsaw here. We could be carving out a little bit of a sideways range, which, Dan, I may remind you, Seasonality for the month of November for the U.S. dollar over the last five and 10 years in the QE era, it hasn't been great. It hasn't been bad. It's kind of just been lukewarm. And so uh, this is an environment where it, perhaps the dollar doesn't make that big move back to October highs uh, just yet. Yeah, and so the chart to me still looks pretty constructive, and I like the, the lines that you've drawn here. And one chart that you've been calling for lower lows, and it's made a series of lower highs and lower lows, is the British pound. And so we just had that break, and it had a bounce um, back above the prior support. You've been all over that here, but here we are now, once again, testing that support. What is your take here, and is there an opportunity? Because I, I look at this and I say, if you break that recent support level, you have a move back possibly possibly below 1.3. Is that something that's in the cards for you? I do think it's certainly a possibility right now, Dan. You know, the British pound has been enjoying what has been a, a resurgent in BOE rate hike odds. At the start of October, the markets were pricing in May 2022 as the first rate hike. When the BOE meets later this week on Thursday, the market's already pulled forward those rate expectations for the first hike coming this week. And yet the British pound hasn't gained all that much ground. So very much like the case for the U.S. dollar, the pound has been priced for perfection. The bar is extremely high for the BOE to clear in order to revitalize uh, upside in the sterling here. So um, if I'm looking at this right now, I do think that even though November tends to be a very good month for the British pound, this may be an opportunity to look for a little bit of a swing lower. And while we don't have the chart with us today, if you are looking to hedge perhaps equity market exposure, you're looking for a counter trend move, a pound yen is of, of, of interest right now, only because the yen has been so weak, the pound has all these rate hike odds priced in. If we do see a downswing, I think that pair in particular could be exposed to a little bit more uh, vulnerability in the near term. Yeah, and so then we have to go to the Aussie here because this one has had a really nice bounce. Um, you know, when you think about it, there's a couple of things going on, uh, rate hike expectations, but also, um, you know, their association with um, some of the commodity um, complexes here. Give me your take here because that's been a really nice bounce. It just took out last month's high here. Um, are we likely to see a retest of those recent that recent double bottom low or are we going to have a runaway breakout here? 
I think the market positioning here is what matters most. In fact, coming into uh, the month of November here, we saw the largest net short position in the futures market, according to the CFTC's COT report, in the Australian dollar ever. And so that means that there's a lot of fuel to burn if the RBA loses credibility. Now, the RBA has already started to lose credibility, Dan. Their yield curve control operation seems to have become uh, untethered in the last week or two. Australian government bond yields on the short end, the one year, the two year, the three year, have absolutely exploded higher. I mean, they look like a Shiba Inu chart if you follow crypto. And so um, the way that I see this playing out, the RBA has started to abandon all pretense of keeping rates low for the time horizon that they previously outlined. I do think that we're heading into a situation where they could be following their regional counterparts. They could be following the RBNZ soon as the recovery picks up pace and rate hike expectations, which are pretty low right now for the RBA. Those could be dragged forward, and that could be something that helps the RBA, or excuse me, the Australian dollar, uh, gain some more upside traction. Aussie dollar may not be the place to look for it, though. It might be Aussie yen, Aussie yen being a rather sensitive risk proxy, not just to commodities, but what's happening in global stocks. And Aussie yen has had a very strong relationship to Bitcoin in recent months. Mm -hmm. And so if Bitcoin prices can continue their leg up towards new highs, that would be a good omen uh, for Aussie yen, which like Bitcoin is a liquidity tracker. Yeah. All right. Real quickly, as we get out of here, because obviously the Fed is going to be the main event um, for the markets that you and I are watching here in the U.S. And, you know, with equity markets at all time highs, VIX very near, you know, one year lows. Um, we have things like Bitcoin just going ballistic, that sort of thing. What is your take right now? What are you expecting? Let's just say the Fed comes in with a 15 billion a month taper um, done by the time in which you suggest, um, you know, and what do we what do we think stocks? What, what's going to happen with stocks this weekend after? the meeting? I think we could see a little bit of a gyration. I'm going to keep my eyes on the bond market first and foremost. It's because uh, bond market volatility is so high right now relative yeah. to equities. Uh, but this should just be a stepping stone towards new highs later on this month, this year. You know that I've been saying that I think what's happening in China is relatively well contained yeah. for the time being. I think that you look at the corporate earnings backdrop. It's been astounding relative to expectations. In fact, if you were to apply a, a Z-score going back to 2003, we're at a, a number three right now, the highest level ever that we've seen over the past 18 years. So markets are really, in a sense, underpriced. In fact, even as the S&P 500's climbed to new all-time highs, the P-E ratio for the broader index has fallen from about 35, 36 earlier this year uh, to where it stands right now, roughly speaking, 28, 29. And so from that perspective, we could be looking at a year-end rally, as Tony Dwyer's note suggested, when we have this strong of a performance through the first 10 months of the year, the final two tend to be good. And November is the best month of the year for stocks during the QE era. So as far as I'm concerned, opportunities to buy the dip in the near term, those remain very appealing. Yeah. All right. Well, I appreciate that. I mean, when you consider the fact that this is going to be, I think that if we do not have a 10% peak to trough decline in 2021, it'll be like one of five in the last 40 or 50 years, which is pretty astounding when you consider basically all the headwinds um, that we've had to growth and the bottlenecks as it relates to supply chain and globalization and that sort of thing. So listen, I really appreciate you, Chris Vecchio, senior strategist at Daily FX for joining me on a week where Guy Adami, I don't know where he is, he's fishing out west or something like that. But we appreciate it, man. Great work today. Um, thank you. Today's macro setup was brought to you by our presenting sponsors, Nadex. They are the leading U.S. exchange for binary options, call spreads, and knockouts. And of course, Open Exchange. They manage virtual meetings that matter for the top companies in the world. I want to thank you all for joining us next week. The macro setup is going to be called something else. It's going to be called the MKT call, the market call, macro, starting next week. So join us next week. We'll tweet it out. You guys follow us on Nadex and IGUS. And thank you very much to our sponsors. Thanks to Open Exchange. We'll talk to you guys next week. Thanks, Chris.